Um, and to continue on with this the general theme, uh, next we turn to procurement reform. Procurement's at the heart of, of, of the way we provide services to the public. And it is critical that we look at how we acquire technology and how we partner with the vendor community. So our next panel will uh, explore this important topic. Please join me in welcoming to the stage a great group of procurement wizards, uh, Tracy Walker, Caitlin Devine, Nancy Dierker, and Kirsten Green. Good afternoon and welcome after lunch. I hope everybody had great lunches and you're all ready to listen to a lot of great information from the panel. My name is Kirsten Green and by trade I am a contracting officer, um, but actually am happily giving up a warrant uh, to uh, join the USDS team and start making a difference, uh, buying, buying things differently and making a difference with the uh, IT community and everything. So um, I will go ahead and hand it off and let everybody introduce themselves. So Tracy. Okay. Uh, my name is Tracy Walker, and I am with U.S. Digital Service. I'm the Director of Digital Service Procurement, and I just hit my five years at USDS. And if anybody knows anything about USDS, we have a term limit of four years. So I've hacked our own process. Um, <laughs> managed to stay on a little longer. <laughs> um, prior to USDS, I did the um, contracts, the IT contracts for the White House, starting under the Bush administration in 2008, and prior to that, doing IT contracts at GSA. Um, so I. I've, this has been my bread and butter basically for all my life and um, it's really exciting to be part of the digital service and trying to transform the way we do this and this kind of conference is amazing to see because like five years ago this would not have been we would not have been sitting in this room talking about these kinds of strategies and approaches with these kinds of uh, people from industry and government so this really makes me happy to see everybody here so thank you Hi, I'm Caitlin Devine. Um, I'm a software engineer by trade. Uh, I, I guess I got started in the government sphere working at the Sunlight Foundation, which was kind of a government oversight uh, nonprofit, um, and having these like constant washes of the government doesn't do this <laughs> right like, all the time, and then I got jaded. But um, I was at AT&F <laughs> from the, basically the beginning. Uh, I was there for four years on a four-year term. Um, I was a software developer. I worked as their first director of engineering, uh, and I was on an extended detail to Treasury to work on the Data Act, which is the first federal open data law, and implementing the new USA spending. Um, so really in more of a product um, development capacity. And then I was at Ad Hoc for a year as their director of innovation, and when I turned out, and I recently went back into government, but I can't appear as that because the invitation was much too late to get that through a clearance <laughs> process in government. So well, just, that's where I am now. <laughs> My name is Nancy Durker. I'm the Director of Procurement for the Colorado Governor's Office of Information Technology. That's a position that I've had for about five months. Uh, before that, I worked on Colorado's integrated eligibility system that calculates eligibility for SNAP, for Medicaid, and for TANF. Um, we were the first state in the country to take our integrated eligibility system to the cloud and then to convert our entire user interface over to Salesforce screens. Um, so we did all of that using Agile methodologies, and when the opportunity came to go down to procurement and bring some Agile to that world, I stepped on that opportunity right away, landmine or not. Um, and so we're trying to work our way through that quagmire. Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and jump into some of the topics. and. Uh, going to try and leave some time at the end for questions. Uh, and if we don't, please, if we don't have any time, please feel free to reach out to any of the panelists um, afterwards. And I mean, we love to talk, we love to share our experience, and we love to share our knowledge. So let's start off with the first one. And um, it's kind of a big, long one. So um, some people like to say that contracts are the problem. And that, that getting into the modern tech and getting it all implemented and, implemented and um, integrated and make it all work right. So why is that? And how is contracting a blocker? Or why do you think it is? Trace? Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks. How much time do we have? Yeah, exactly. You thought I was going to leave you out. So the, 
best part about my job of being a contracting officer, um, I'm not a type A personality um, at all, but the thing that I've loved about this, don't look at me like that, Chad. Um, the thing I like about uh, being an acquisition is the fact that you get to be a problem solver. And um, a lot of times in the contracting world, you train up and you take people and say you have to have, um, you have, to have a degree, you have to have all the supplemental uh, certification and training, um, which is pretty much the only only job uh, area in the government that you have to come on board and continually get trained all the time um, in order to do the job because you are handling the government's dollars basically and so they want trusted um, professionals in that world and then when you get into the contracting offices and to um, how things are actually done you stop listening to those trusted um, advisors and start saying of course I know how to build I know how to do and I know what the market is going to look like um, but instead of looking to the people who have been trained as being buyers negotiators and understanding where the regulations allow for flexibilities you say okay I'm just going to find a solution and now you find a way to get that to me um, and a lot of times that's where contract contracting offices say, no, I can't do that, or the what you want isn't the way this is going to happen, or it's going to take you so long to get it because I just don't understand the terminology you're using. And so I think there's a, some of those problems that we look at is the um, terminology again, but also what are the outcomes that we're looking for? A lot of times people just say, give me the solution and then go buy this. And what we are trying to do um, is really get people to start talking about the problems, looking at the contract process itself as a product, designing and engineering that to um, fulfill what the outcome is supposed to be, which is going back to hopefully like a product vision or some kind of uh, idea of what the end users actually would want to be using. And so, um, you know, I think the problem again is one of the other problems is that we don't ever connect our contracting people and professionals and program offices with the actual end users of the systems they're doing. They're so far removed from that process, they have no idea what that actually looks like. And so, um, you know, those are a couple, like I said, we could go on and on about the, the, the problems, but that's just kind of what I see as culture and uh, terminology and then their place in the role uh, isn't being highlighted um, as a professional in this space. And Caitlin, what do you see? Uh, I totally agree with Tracy's point, um, especially about starting with the problem versus the solution. And I think part of it, I don't, I'm not the first one to say this, but, you know, the procurement has gone from the structural of buying items or buying, you know, like construction projects, you know, like things that are very long scale and like well known also what you need to have. Um, and squaring that with what modern software development is, which is reacting to new needs and new information and services. And I think a lot of our contracting officer's job is about minimizing risk. And I just think there are, you know, misconceptions about how to actually manage that or what the risk actually is. Um, so I think a lot of when I was at H&F was like, no, what you are doing now is actually high risk. Um, <laughs> because you, you really, you're assuming that you know everything up front about what, you're, what you need to anticipate or need to understand to build this. Um, so it's kind of shifting that mindset of being less about all the upfront definition, unless you're really talking about the problem just by itself and more about how can we build for flexibility and build to constantly reduce risk by, by incorporating new information as we go. Um, there's a lot to say, but I think that's, that's one of them, one of the key things that kind of builds on what Tracy was saying. And I couldn't agree with them more. Um, I think one of the reasons that the contract gets blamed is because when things go wrong, it has you stuck where you are. And it's the reason you can't get out of your situation because you've contracted for exactly what you got, and now that you're not happy with it, you're stuck, essentially. Um, so in, in my experience, the best solution is to break down the silos to get the buyers involved with the contract folks, involved with the program area, and involved with the users, and have them all participate in the buying process, the solicitation process, to make sure that everyone's on board what we're trying to accomplish and what outcomes we're trying to achieve. And that will take us a long way towards maybe getting what we want. Awesome. I would say one more thing on that. Have you ever read a contract? The language. <laughs> Why is that a problem? Because we don't actually say what we what we want. We throw it in all this uh, jargony terminology instead of like applying plain language and concepts to the contract document itself as well. Um, and so then you get a lot of you know interpretation issues, and that's just where we've the government have gone back to um, the like you said minimizing risk. Uh, it's safe 
to use those big words. It's safe to use this thing that you don't even understand what you're trying to buy. Um, because then when it doesn't work, you'd be like, well, that's not what I meant. Um, <laughs> anybody have that problem? Yeah. No one's yeah. ever seen <laughs> uh, And so that's, that's another piece of that is just uh, finding a way to just truly connect with the community, the vendor community, and saying, here's what we want. Um, how are you going to provide it for us? And then letting that plain language kind of come through and start at the solicitation process too. So. Yeah, I think when I left, it, when I worked as a vendor writing my first proposal, I, I think I knew abstractly in theory that the contracts were written poorly, but I was like, oh no. <laughs> I just, I think I, it was like a total rude awakening, even though like I knew, like my uh, rational brain knew it was bad, but then like my lizard brain was confronted with it, was like, oh my God, this is terrible. Um, <laughs> So it's just, it's the same way that you build products that are user-centered is like empathizing with people who use them. You're like, oh, this is like, of course it's broken. <laughs> it makes total sense. Great. All right, so uh, one of the values we have at USDS is to tell the truth. And so a lot of that sometimes is based on having that hard conversation of sharing failures, um, which a lot of people don't do. Um, a lot of times it's mopped up under the rug and we just kind of forget about it or whatever. We don't use that, um, that to help teach or share or learn. So. Um, can you all think of maybe one example of a contract where it was just completely a failure and then, you know, what did you learn from that? So, Nancy? Oh, it, it's hard to find just one, one yeah. example. <laughs> I know, I know. It is hard to find one like so. example. Um, my my um, sort of illustration of this is in Colorado, it takes probably five years to deliver a new system because it's a year or two in the budget process to get the money, then to do the solicitation, and then to start building. And everyone is very clear what they want at the start of that process. When five years later it's delivered, if it's delivered, um, you get the house with the green shag carpet and the avocado appliances <laughs> that were very trendy <laughs> when you started the process. <laughs> <laughs> and in the 1970s. In the 1970s, right. And so what we are seeing is that a lot of our contracts, one, um, we tend to just abdicate all of our control and our voice to the vendor to solve our problems. And when they come back and they solve our, what they perceive to be our problems, we're not happy. And so we have systems that have been in development for three years, millions of dollars expended, and we have nothing to show for it, and the systems are proprietary, so we can't step away. If we step away, we start over, and all of that money is lost. It, it's a huge problem. I mean, I'll just give something that happened like two weeks ago. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not like a, on a huge scale of failure, but uh, totally, even though I know better, you know, I think, you know, now I'm like a relatively high level position. So um, I think p vendors and the government kind of get into the cycle where it's like, oh, like that one leader said something in a meeting, like, what does it mean? Oh my God, we have to like respond to it. And like, you know, what does she want? And all this sort of stuff. Um, because, you know, we're trying to, like, solve a problem, and I'm an engineer, so I love a solution by trade. Like, it's just, it's part of my um, personality. And so while talking about the problem, I muddied the waters quite a bit by throwing out some potential <laughs> solutions. Um, and I think it just was like, yes, we have to do that because she said it. Like, it doesn't matter if it's the best way to do that or not. But, so, yeah, it's cathartic for this guy, right? <laughs> um, but it was just like, you know, and I could tell that the internal vendor team was, like, having a lot of, like, I could, you can tell someone's face when they're back channeling on Slack during a meeting. Um, everyone just yelling at each other, like, doing the thing that she said. And, and then I was like, okay, this, I did not follow my own advice. Like, I know better. And I, I think that's a good illustration of, like, even if you know all the right things to do, it's still really hard to be disciplined about it. And, con you know, it's like when you are prioritizing, right, like what's the most important work to be done right now, like in the context of a sprint or whatever, it's really hard to always be asking yourself that question, even though it's really important. Um, and you, it's just very easy to lose sight of that. And so... I had to like, step back and be like, okay, like, let me just <laughs> articulate what I see as the problem, and then we can come back and you, know, you can talk to me about what, what might be a good idea here. Um, but it's, it's hard to do, but still super important. Um, so you know, even people who are experts on a panel about it uh, still do it all the time. 
Um, so my kind of my biggest one probably goes back to when I was still working um, as a contracting officer on the WhiteHouse.gov contract, and we were getting ready to launch the petitions website, um, We the People. And so this was your kind of traditional cost plus award fee contract that we'd inherited from the um, you know previous administration. And uh, one of the challenges we had with that was that when we launched We the People, it wasn't properly tested the way it should be somewhat of a precursor to another big website. Um, so when it launched, it didn't work. And of course, that's massively embarrassing to the president and everything, and, and that was, you know, we're all scrambling to figure out what to do and, and how to fix this. And we had to pay a lot of money um, to get the thing working again, even though we weren't the reason that it actually didn't work. It was, it was a combined, you know, um, with our CIO office and everything. We're just like, what, what, what do we need to do to fix it? And there was a lot of money that went into the resolution of the problem. So then the program office basically said, okay, we need to change the way we do this kind of contract. Um, so my uh, product owner at the time came to me and said, we want to try something new. It's called Agile. Um, have you heard of it? I'm like, no. And he's like, well, you can't write a contract for it. And I was like, try me. He's like, well, I don't know what I want. I don't know how much it's going to cost. I don't know when I want it. But I only want to pay for results. And I was like, all right, challenge accepted. <laughs> so we figured out how to then take um, and look at uh, sprints and iterations. I learned what those meant. Um, and the idea that technology wasn't ever going to go into a steady state, that you're always going to be updating it, um, and that the process itself is good enough to be able to combine all those things in there, testing and QA and you know usability and everything within a very small time frame. And so we started looking and, and doing the experimenting at that time with Agile Software Development um, and putting those into contracts and found ways to do that, that we're, uh, you know, I've, I've got my, my standard of, of saying like, here's what we need to be doing for these kinds of contracts, and it keeps working. So until somebody proves me wrong, I'm gonna keep going with that. But really it's looking at how do we um, pay for the results, so we're using service to get an end delivered result. And that in government is like, makes people's head kind of go like, eh, you're actually buying a product, but you're doing the service to get to it. And so um, it's, it's really fun to see how the uh, variations and the iterations of that have come out over the years. Um, but from what I've seen, and a lot of the people in this room have been on these contracts um, on both sides of these and are seeing things delivered, um, it seems to kind of keep working. So out of that failure has come new models and saying, how do we use the regulations that are available to us, the flexibilities? All of this stuff is allowable within, and we didn't have to go and change a law. It's already available for us, because the FAR didn't say we couldn't, so you can, and that's a big thing in the government. Um, is that if it isn't written down, people are really afraid to try something new. Um, and so we're trying to keep and continually push those kinds of, of uh, practices. Awesome, thank you. All right, so Caitlin, um, I know you have been on both sides of as far as government and industry, as far as building um, proposals and all of that fun stuff. <laughs> so I'd love to get some insight on from both uh, both levels of what you've learned and what you've seen, and then you know Tracy and, and Nancy, you know, basically from the state side, and then Tracy from the government side. So just kind of what you've uh, what you've you know experienced with uh, proposals on the government and industry side. Um. That's a big question. Uh, yeah, I think it's still, even when we are dealing with agile contracts, it's still hard to write something where you have a lot of room for um, that initial kind of prototyping and discovery. Because I still think at the end of the day, there is some element of solutioning already pre-built into contracts. You know, and it's like a spectrum to varying degrees. So, you know, you walk the bounce. Um, it, it really doesn't leave you a lot of room to propose something new and innovative in many ways because you're worried about the contract being marked as compliant. And if it's not compliant, then literally it does not matter what you say. Um, so I, I think a lot of times the way proposals are still structured is you kind of have to figure out, you're still trying to read the tea leaves and anticipate what, what it is they're asking for because, you know, there is something in their mind <laughs> that they're asking for and you kind of have to, like, guess what it is. Um, so I think to the extent that we can do more of building a room for that, where you could have a compliant proposal that is proposing something no one on the TEP has thought of, or no one in the authoring the RFP or the eval criteria thought of beforehand. And so right now, I don't really think there's a way to do that. Um, of course, I mean, it depends on how it's written, but in my experience, I didn't see a lot that made room for that. Um, I think. 
Um, <laughs> what else should I say about that? Um, I still think we do a lot of structural things that were intended to help um, new entrants to the market. Um, you know, I think government accidentally creates markets for all kinds of things without even um, trying to. Uh, I mean, it was like Michael was saying, right? Like, if you ask for it, like, people will develop that capability. Of course, you're going to have that gap where the, the supply is there and the, um, dem or the demand is there and the supply is not. Um, but there's a lot of things, you know, like breaking things up into to teeny tiny T&M contracts, it does add a huge amount of overhead. Um, whereas if you haven't done anything to bring that overhead down, you're just kind of like adding everything on top of the existing staff. So I think there's a fine balance there between coming down from a $500 million contract and not having anything over like $6 million. So, you know, there's like a huge range in there. So I think it's finding the right balance of that and really figuring out how to, you know, building a successful team isn't actually that different. Um, doing it in the context of contracting than just if everybody worked for you. Um, and, but right now we don't evaluate contractors like that, you know, so I always want to see like, you know, what people have done, how do they, um, what do they learn from their past failures? And, like you never see a question like that in a contract or anything of like, how do you measure growth potential? Um, those are things that are really hard to evaluate in contracts. Uh, so I think like if we can start trying out more ways to do that, um, it would be good. I think there's still a huge bias towards people who are already doing work in like a particular office. You know, I think a lot of times just the fact that you've done work there gives you a leg up. Yeah. Um, it could even be terrible work, <laughs> but it still gives you a leg up there. And so I think we have to kind of get around that as well. Um, and it's sad, but you can't just do really good work and hope to get more contracts from that. Like that's just not how it works at all. Um, and so I think it just is a crystallized when I'm like on both sides of this now. And I think it's good to come back into government now having that perspective uh, and think about how to be part of the solution and that, and not just kind of doing the same stuff over and over. Great. Trace? Oh. Okay. Um, so from what we've seen, I'll, I'll piggyback on the, the kind of the performance retrospective. One of the things, of course, the government uh, gets really big on is past performance, but a lot of times what we look at is government past performance. And so we are trying to encourage people to look at what people have built and done in the commercial industry as an indicator of what they can then come in and bring to the government, as opposed to saying your government past performance is more important than your industry past performance. And a lot of times on the acquisitions that I work on, I you know prefer to use things where past performance has already been evaluated as part of an IDIQ or as a schedule or as something that they've already had that so then you can really get into a performance retrospective and say all right tell me about a time when you failed and explain what happened give us a case study as opposed to a past performance survey I want to know what happened what did you learn and so we've been using case studies as an initial evaluation step um, as opposed to just that initial past performance kind of traditional thing. So tell us your story about your, um, your company and what you did to solve a problem that's similar to the thing that we are going to have you come in and try to solve. Um, and those are good indicators to try to say, okay, is this going to potentially be successful or not? Uh, the other thing I see a lot of, um, and this is just kind of how we write things, but at the same time, what we want to see from industry. Uh, so when you kind of look at what a contract is, just is its basic form, it's we have a problem, you're going to help us fix it, and you're going to do a set of things that you're going to promise to do for us, and then we're going to pay you for that. And if you don't do the things that you promise to do for us, we're not going to pay you for that. That's pretty simple. Um, but where it gets complicated is when we get responses back from the governments uh, sometimes where we don't see the specific promise that you're going to make to us. You tell us instead, here's where we've done this for other people, but it makes no direct correlation to what are you going to do for me. Um, and so uh, being very specific about how your company or how your solution is going to work for me and my environment in my specific world is more important than what you may have done sometimes in other places or just saying that we can do this. Yes, we can doesn't mean that I'm promising that I'm going to do it for you. And so from both sides of that, making sure that you get that link between, yes, we can do something. And we see this sometimes when you're doing the design challenges and the demos and some of those things which are very you know, forward thinking and saying, okay, we want to try to change the way we do acquisition. But there still needs to be the tie-in between what you demoed and what you designed and what you might have done as part of the solicitation process and the performance that we're going to expect from you 
uh, when you actually come on board and, and work for us, or if you're a program office, what you can then expect from your companies. So making sure that there's that tie and relationship, and from a vendor perspective, making sure that you see that as well, because then you're protected. So I see that we fall down a lot of times in that area of not necessarily getting that true understanding of what it is that I need and how you're going to promise to do it. So. Can I just add one more thing? Um, <laughs> I was thinking about it. Uh, so I, I think a lot of the materials we have out there, too, that can help people kind of move towards this, like, you know, USDS obviously has a lot of good stuff. ATNF has put out a lot of good things, are very engineering focused. So, um, I mean, I'm an engineer. Uh, it's great. Um, but my takeaway from leaving government, you know, the first time was that um, there is a lot of people out there who can kind of build whatever you ask for, but asking for the right thing. Uh, is super important, and that's where um, product management and design and user research comes in. And I feel like often the contracts are very unbalanced because we focus a lot on, like, you have continuous integration and continuous deployment and testing. And, that, like, there's so many things that are very respo we're responding to the healthcare.gov failure, right? <laughs> like, or of something like not working. Um, and, and then you get this real out of whack product team where it's like the different disciplines aren't present in balanced amounts. Um, so I think that's also something to kind of look out for. Um, we have a group of vendors who regularly respond to solicitations, and in 99% of those instances, they're trying to tell us, sell us somebody else's solution and saying, this will work for you. We're, we're going to make it work. And <laughs> so, <laughs> or not. Um, <laughs> three years and five hundred million dollars later, um, <laughs> and so it's a it's a learning curve for both those of us who are trying to procure for government and for the vendors to say no, we're doing something different, and what, we're not looking for a solution; we're looking for a partner, and that has been a real eye opener for our vendor community. As I've said that. Like, well, well, what do you mean? If we build this, then we get the lifetime contract to maintain it, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. If we sell you this, then it's still our proprietary product, and so if you don't like us, we're going to take our product and go home. No, that also doesn't work for me. And so those have been kind of hard conversations to have to get everyone out of their current paradigm and say, we're looking to do it differently. And you can't take your experience in figuring out how to solve the world's problems and then imposing it on them and help us find the right solution for our current situation. So that has been a discussion that we've been having with our vendor community. Um, we Our most recent solicitation that we put out there, we got 10 bids back and Five of them, at least, were for proprietary solutions that they felt like, you know, your short timeline, we got that because we've already built the product and we're ready to just customize it for you. Um, and unfortunately, for those folks who were participating in the selection process, it was very comfortable for them to say, we know this company, we know their products, this will be a good deal, and there's much less risk. But they're, they're looking at risk much more um, strictly, much more lim in a much more limited fashion than we are looking at what happens when it goes wrong or what happens when it's their way or the highway and we're, they're taking our money and their solution and leaving. Great. All right. So... Um, going to kind of jump based on all that information, um, talking about what you've experienced already. Um, like to get some thoughts on what are the, um, where do you see the next iteration of digital services going? Where, where do you see, you know, the ecosystem or, you know, what, what's, what's moving forward that we can look forward to? Anyone could jump? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always think it's interesting that the U.S. doesn't look more towards the U.K. and see what they're doing with service design. Like, I mean, I, I think there are many years ahead of us in terms of, um, and I've seen many technical projects go wrong because the software is meant to um, do some kind of, you know, business process reform. 
and they think that they can control it and make that happen with the software when like obviously there's many different things that go along with that you have to there's the people whole people aspect it's like a big one um and the process itself and then the, so the software should enable that um but we often look at it as just like the technical thing that we buy so i think watching what they're doing in the uk with service design and building that capacity all over their government um, I think that's honestly where we should be going. That path somewhat already carved out for us. We just, no one here seems to be like kind of going down it. Um, cause I, I think there are so many things that you discover when you do user research on a government software product. That's like, well, so much of this goes back to the process and like, you know, why do veterans have to do this? It's cause there's like 8,000 regs that say this, this or that. Um, and when you're on the software team, like, what am I going to do about that? Um, and there aren't really good channels to funnel those insights back to where they should go. Um, so I think to the extent that we're looking at the service and the, and the experience and the software all together is really where we should be going. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at from our perspective is how do we, you know, help implement the presence management agenda and specifically uh, 21st century workforce. How do we make this a longer term play? And one of the things at USDS, you talked, you've heard before that, you know, we we bring in people that are engineers and product um, and design into the government um, to do kind of a tour of duty. Same thing with 18F and, and TTS. Uh, but what does that look like for the long term thing? Because that's not enough people to really make that difference. So uh, where we're really looking at is how do we re uh, or upskill the workforce um, and through training, basically. And so a couple different areas that we've done at USDS in conjunction with Office of Federal Procurement Policy. Um, you know, last year we, we created a uh, digital service training program for the contracting officers. So training buyers to understand these terminologies um, and then being able to work with their program offices and be that business advisor that I kind of talked about. So yes, more training for contracting people, but hopefully it'll be in the area of understanding when a designer comes and says, I need user research. Uh, and you know, to what Mike was saying earlier, that they understand how to put that into an acquisition and it's not just Greek to them to say, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so we've had a lot of success with that right now. We have had many, many, many cohorts. We have many graduates right now, definitely over, I'd say close to 250 to 300 people involved and enrolled in the digital service training program. Um, raise your hand in the room if you are either involved with providing the training program or a graduate or a current student of it. So, as you can see around here, we have a lot of people involved in this. Uh, we're building the market for this as well. Um, so, an intentional market build on this one. Um, <laughs> uh, but right now, we're focusing on, so that's the front end of the contract. What about the administration of a contract? So, working and looking at the program, the cores, uh, the people that have to administer these. So, we're working on doing a product owner training. What does that look like? So, hopefully, then we can start bringing product thinking into the government um, and then, you know, looking to where, where do we bring in, you know, design and really looking and focusing on who in the seats right now are adept at that and could be or would be interested in doing that. And so I think there's going to be a lot of interest in this in the government for getting these new kinds of skill sets and stuff so that they get to, um, it's a lot of fun in this space. Like it really is like designing and building and delivering products is amazingly awesome. And so, you know, bringing that joy joy into the government would be really cool to, to see that. So that's kind of where we're going with what we're doing. At the state level, we're trying to change the culture and that's really our next step. We just got our own little digital services group. Yay, Yay. Colorado. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so our, our IT department in, for Colorado government is over a thousand people. We have 4.7 new digital officers that we're going to bring in to... 4.7? 4.7, yeah. I, it's a dog. Yeah. yeah. Don't apply if you're not sure which one of those positions it is that they're filling. Um, but we have to change the, the language around what we're doing across the board. We have... Our, our legislators who fund our programs want to know what are the deliverables and when am I going to get this system. They, they're not interested in when will I start seeing an outcome <laughs> and they're interested in what's it going to cost me. When I say this is going to look more like time and materials, everyone goes, what? 
<laughs> we can't do that because they just assume that that's writing a blank check um, rather than actually realizing when that time is run, you're going to have something that you own that's yours that you can build on. So for us, I, I feel like we're just dipping our toes in. The governor and um, the latest administration has said, yes, we are all in on Agile. And then they signed people up for contract management classes to <laughs> teach them how to do that. <laughs> Not a joke. Not a joke. I'm enrolled. Villanova <laughs> University. Contract management certificate program. Um, second course, I haven't heard the word agile yet. I haven't heard iteration. I, none of the language. So uh, <laughs> it's wonderful to hear that things are moving so much faster at the federal level. <laughs> And Tracy's my new best friend. <laughs> I got <So>. you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we have a long way to go to change the culture to make it work. Great. All right. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and open up the floor to any questions from anybody. And, yeah, please make sure the, the mic will come around to you. So I'm also a federal contracting officer, uh, tons of IT experience in my career. Um, we are doing a lot of agile development now. and. There are very strong views on contract type for doing these sprints or iterations or whatever you want to call them. And I, I heard a lady talk about the TNM. I'm curious what other people's perspectives are uh, based on your experiences. Ooh. I think it does not matter at all. Um, so <laughs> I know that a lot of the, like, the I, I, I don't think I'm on the same page as my, some of my digital service. Like, you know, certainly ATF doesn't agree, but like, <laughs> I just don't think it matters um, as long as you are engaged in the delivery of this of the product and you know still seeing progress on that and value delivered on a regular basis. That's the most important thing, and I think you can easily do that under a firm fixed price contract. It's lower overhead for the government. It's lower overhead for the contractor because like that stuff's just going to get passed on to you in the cost of program management. Um, and like I, I think that incentivizes better teams overall. Because you can't, it's actually, you know, I've been on TNM contracts where, um, like on, when I was at Treasury, it's actually a huge pain because, like, our needs change over the life of the product development. So in the beginning, we need all these people who specialize in, like, financial data, whatever. And they're like, okay, like, we know a lot. Like, now we need more usability folks, whatever. It's super hard because you have to mod the contract, move things around between the labor categories and the client. Like, it becomes, like, a huge pain. But um, with Run for Express, you can just kind of flex the team as you need it, as your needs change. Um, and uh, I, I think it encourages better team building on the contractor side as well, because um, their, their incentive is for people to work more, right, if they are billing for every hour. But if you are trying to build kind of like a healthy team that has good practices around code review and is working together as a team, and like, you know, one of the things you see a lot happen on Agile projects is instead of everyone coming together to tackle the stories that are at the top of the backlog, meaning they're the most important, everyone's just focused on whatever they're assigned, um, which is a big anti-pattern I think you see a lot because the oversight is how many story points and who's accountable for those story points and blah, 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 blah right? So I, I think there's, there's so much overhead in tracking with TNM. I don't know if it's worth, um, worth all of that. And I think as long as you have product owners on the government side that are really engaged in tracking the deliver delivery on a regular cadence that the contract itself doesn't matter. I have so many thoughts on this. <laughs> <laughs> it could be its own talk, but I will sum it up. <laughs> um, so where I've always existed is know your program and who's going to be administering your contract and the skills that they have related to what it is that you're actually doing. And this is where risk comes in and that's related to contract type. So time and materials is a more risky or labor hours are more risky uh, contract type because you do have to be more on it to this is where the government is taking the risk. So if you don't have a strong program who understands product delivery and understands how to do this methodology, you're incurring a lot of risk from that standpoint. Whereas if you go with the firm fixed price, the risk then transfers more to the um, contractor side to say that. But this is again not saying that you you need to have all of your requirements listed up front in a big, huge document that is going to be outdated as soon as you um, sign the contract. That is where we're looking at what is it you're actually buying, and in our world with Agile software development, you're buying time box iterations or time boxed discovery times or delivery times. So looking at it from that perspective of 
what is the smallest unit of measure that I can put some kind of a parameter around and end up knowing that I'm going to pay for a deliverable. Um, and so that's where we've changed that model of saying we know that we're going to get something at the end of the contract to saying we're going to unbind our technical scope, which is what the system has to do, with our contractual scope and say, okay, we're going to buy a process, a repeated process for the delivery of working product. And then we can assign um, firm fixed price on that. Now in terms of cost type, I am very against that in any of this because this is a commercial item process. Agile software development, user-centered design, all these processes were developed in industry and now government is trying to adapt them. We are not doing R&D just because you don't know what your end product looks like. We know we want an end product and we know that we're going to get to that, um, but the process of Agile is the whole, the whole using the process defines that you're going to get something eventually out of that. So you're not going in saying, I don't know that I'm going to get anything at the end of that, which is kind of where that, the real true version of what cost kind of goes into. So we see government taking a little bit more risk in that side of things by not applying kind of that commercial item methodology and mentality to it. So even if you, even if government I know says a lot of times we've got proprietary solutions, we've got proprietary problems. <laughs> you don't need to have a proprietary solution to fix a proprietary problem. And so this is where you can apply commercial items, services, and techniques and um, contract types to that. Anybody wants to know more? I will be out there afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so one of the challenges I see that's still pretty persistent is definition of success uh, for government technology uh, work. And until we can shift the mindset that value is outcomes realized for people and programs versus output delivered to a product owner at the end of a sprint, um, a lot of these things we've been talking about today don't really matter, right? Because it's still very deliverable focused as opposed to like what are we actually building towards. What are your thoughts on that, and how can the procurement process help sort of shift the mindset on the government side, on the buyer side, to focus more on outcomes for people and programs as opposed to strict deliverables? <laughs> this is really hard <laughs> because we can, we can set it up to say we all agree these are the outcomes we're looking for, once the contract is signed, then it's kind of in their hands to carry that ball, um, at, least, at least in my world. And so that's a real challenge, and that's part of that culture shift, I think, um, in terms of getting folks to stop looking at the deliverable is the system, and we're looking for an outcome, and have we resolved our problems and achieve the outcomes we're looking for. The only, th the only way I see you can do that is if you clearly outline those up front and then regularly check to measure how far you've come in terms of reaching those outcomes. Um, and that in and of itself is another task that has not existed previously. Yeah, I was also going to say something about measurement, I, but I, I think <laughs> A lot of times what happens now to, that makes this really difficult is that we don't have a good baseline for where we are. So, okay, we have XYZ legacy system. People can't use it. It's really hard, whatever. Um, and, of course, it doesn't have analytics or other things that make it easier to track those metrics built into it. And we kind of write it off and just say, like, well, we'll start building new and hope it's better. But, you know, you, lose, you do lose something there. And I, I think it is worth investing a little bit of time to kind of establishing your baseline for that. Mm -hmm. But, um, and that means like taking time at the beginning, which almost nobody has an appetite to do. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's part of where, how we can get to that is, you know, obviously you have to do work on the government side of, of talking about success in terms of outcomes versus outputs, but like uh, understanding where you actually are um, and defining that picture very crisply, I think will make it a lot easier to say, look, what this has to change. And most people don't evaluate the current state um, with that kind of honesty. I have one thing I'd like to add to that in terms of metrics. I have a metric assigned to me that says, we're going to use more agile contracting and we're going to reduce vendor issues by 5%. <laughs> In our, in our current state fiscal year. So I have until June to reduce vendor issues. <laughs> I don't have a baseline. I, I don't know what those look like. 
And I don't know how any contract that I'm negotiating today will move the dial in the next six months. So um, I think it really does, it is important to look at what you're measuring and how long it's going to take to actually see that outcome come to fruition. Good. Mm -hmm. we have questions? Any other questions? We have yes. about, we, yeah, we're, we're getting ready to wrap up, but um, <laughs> anyway, so. Real, 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 real quick. Real quick? Yeah. Okay, so right. we're moving to mm -hmm. product and portfolio based in the, in the federal government in my agency. And we're hearing that we should be contracting for teams and the capacity of teams. Mm -hmm. uh, don't know what we want, doesn't matter. Um, don't know when it's going to be delivered, doesn't matter, and I'm not being, I'm kind of borrowing mm -hmm. on your line, but, <laughs> um, but to where that team could be moved maybe on a quarterly basis to the next priority, right? The work comes to the team, um, and so the contract scope is open because we don't know what they're going to be potentially working on in uh, six months to a year. So what type of, have you managed or written any contracts for teams with certain capacities? Uh, yes, and uh, it, it's actually, uh, I mean, kind of the way we set up the, the way that we do the contracts, like where you want the teams to go and that kind of thing. I mean, there, there are rules that all contracts still have to kind of apply to um, in terms of it just can't be the blank check approach, but um, you know, the idea that you're kind of looking at, they're looking at a modular based approach, an iterative based approach, and you're saying, okay, we're going to work on something, see if it works, and then move you to the next one. I think it's actually a good idea, you know, in, in, in that sense. But making sure the teams aren't 200 people, um, <laughs> that they really are based on the agile software development methodologies right. and so user center design. We're out of time, but again, thank you for all your time, and um, feel free to reach out to any of the panelists, um, be around, and. Thank you for all your participation.